So, um, so yeah, so basically, as I was saying, for those who have just um, joined on, don't worry, Jane. Jane just put she was a bit late. We understand you're probably out there clapping for the NHS. We've just been talking about that. So um, don't worry, everyone's on now. Oh, sure, we'll, we'll be adding in. So what we want to talk about, though, is project management and how to pay yourself uh, whilst managing your projects. Uh, or, or, as I just said there, how you can save yourself money by making sure your projects are being managed properly. So, you know, what does project management involve and, you know, what, um, what should you be looking out for in either of those roles? So, Nick, if you can click on the slideshow for me, please. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, um, some of you all know who, well, I, I should imagine that uh, a few of you know I am. Some of you all know Nick is, but Nick's behind the scenes a little bit more than me. So I wanted to introduce him properly. But for those of you who perhaps um, don't know who I am, so basically I'm Andy Cook from um, White Box Property Solutions. As you can see there, actually we quite like our boxes and we like our colours. So I started off um, in 2007 as a carpenter myself. So I'm from the trades and I, um, I set up Red Box Property Developments. Now Red Box was at the time just me in a van doing you know pretty much house refits and kitchens bathrooms and and just saying yes to anything and then working out how to do it um i partnered up with lord girardi in 2014 um just before that i had built my own house the house i'm in now actually and um we set up a host of other box companies so we've got white box green box is our lettings company blue box is a property management company yellow box developments and purple box is a, a land and commercial sourcing uh, we've got a few others around that as well but i won't bore you with those and um, we've got some special purpose vehicles as well so that's a term that we use spvs is a term that we use when we set up a company to do a development in so specifically um, you know, we've got one for instance in milton Keynes. Um, so, and it's in the, the area of Simpson. So it's a company we set up called Simpson MK and it's literally just to do that development in it's ring fences that development in there. So when we finish that development, we'll sell those properties or whatever we're going to do with them. And then we'll shut that company down. And you know, if we did another one down the road, we would set a new one up for that. So that doesn't include those. So that's kind of us. We, we, um, as white box, we train a lot of people in development. We've got the property developers secrets, um, Facebook group, which, you know, is about 16 and a half thousand people on it. I'm sure most of you are members on that. If you're not, you should be, it's a, a really active and supportive group. Um, and we also run the property developers secrets, um, three day property development, um, training program, which again, many of the people on here, I'm sure have, have come across or been on and, you know, we train and support people through the whole of the development process. So, We've been doing that for a few years now, and about, about three years ago, I'm sure that Nick will correct me in a minute if I'm wrong, but about three years ago, um, a guy came onto the course who um, was no um, stranger to property and development, but he was doing it for other people. He was doing it specifically for a corporate. He was working for Taylor Wimpy. He'd been working for Taylor Wimpy for quite a long time, about 11 years at the time, and he wanted to sort of see how he could do it for himself and you know maybe come away from the sort of comfortable corporate lifestyle and um or you know getting stuck in the the corporate routine and see about you know setting up his own sites so he came on the course it was a two-day course at the time and um he saw the potential in in maybe you know breaking away and and it, it gave him the, the idea but he didn't quite know how to to go through with it so he approached me and he said well can we work together and you know uh, i can help you project manage your sites alongside maybe getting some of my own going like i said that was about three years ago and that was the first time i met nick leading so nick i just want to bring you in now and introduce you properly. So that, that's your, your background to it. I'd like you to sort of go into that a little bit more, please. But yeah, to everybody, here's Nicholas Leading. Yeah, so it was actually 2016, so it's four years. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Wow. Um, so I, I, 2016, I came on the course, um, as Andy said, I, I'd been building houses for years. I've done my own projects, but on a smaller scale, like ones and uh, refurbs and conversion bits and pieces, as well as doing, um, the main build sort of churning out between 50 to 100 plus houses a year with a big team of guys around me and i wanted to understand the other elements to it that weren't on the more construction based side so i didn't have a huge amount of clue about the funding side 
I didn't have a clue uh, uh, the planning side and the legals. Those are things that I needed a bit more uh, help on from a leveraging point of view because I don't know about you guys out there, but there's only a certain point you get to with your own funds. And I found that what I was doing uh, wasn't leveraging enough and I was able to do projects, but there's only a certain limit to what you can do with your own funds and things like that. And I wanted to understand how I could get investors, how I could... Um, scale on a, on a on a sort of effect to be able to do more stuff than just the odd one project and uh, get out of the corporate because it wasn't ever something I wanted to be in forever it was a sort of a stepping stone to the next thing so my sort of corporate journey if you like is I I didn't come through university and I didn't have the sort of that side of it I worked in a practical sense on sites and, and became a assistant site manager back in 2005-06 when I was 23 I think it was and then I worked all the way up through um, from doing that to running my own sites, to running larger sites, to having bigger teams and having multiples of people below you running the big compounds and, and making sure uh, everything was sweet. So um, that was sort of the, the way I went, but all the way along doing my own stuff in my spare time as well. So sort of building that rounded sort of scenario. So uh, met these two guys through uh, a mutual connection that, um, that's very close to Lloyd and um, started to sort of look into how I could do things myself. And then it wasn't till um, June 2017 that I left the corporate role. And um, it's now been three years out of the corporate, four years since I met these guys. So yeah, things have things definitely changed a year onto that. Um, and um, we, uh, we've sort of been progressing since. Yeah, so definitely, sir. And that was a big changing point for us because uh, Nick bought all of that sort of corporate governance if you like and you know the hosts of um paperwork that they have with them and you know the, the site safety stuff and all the stuff that you know a, a fully rounded project manager should be controlling and we'll, we'll, what we'll describe to you today and what we're going to show you tonight is the, the the roundedness of a project manager it's not just about when you get onto site and you know when you get a, a spade in the ground if you like and and running the, the day to day that's that's kind of a site manager um, a project manager is fully rounded right from the the purchase of a site or even the, the planning of a purchase of a site and the due diligence involved with that right through to the delivery of a site and you know how it's going to be sold or rented out at the other end and all of the the planning of you know costings materials and call offs and everything in between it so actually the on site bit is just a part of that it's um it's you know it's a fraction of it in some ways it's not um it's not the full um job by any means so what nick brought to us with that was um you know he 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 standardized our processes and our systems and and before that it was kind of just me feeling my way like i say i was just a carpenter i didn't have all that experience that nick had and you know i found my way through by will and making mistakes really but of course mistakes are, are costly you you learn the, the lessons but you learn them by quite a heavy um, entrance fee if you like or you can do so what we thought we'd do is we'd show you some of how that's progressed into some of the the sites that that we're on and working on at the moment and um, just before i go into those though um there's um there was a, a comment in here about someone with a hand up. I'm not watching the um, the participants page with the hands up. If you have got a question, just whack it into the chat, and I will or we will get round to them. We're, some of them will leave to the end though, because we want to get through quite a lot of information on here. But if you put it in the chat, we have got the chat box open, and if it's a quick thing, we may just have it in if it's relevant at the time. Okay, so um, if you'd like to move on, so. We're going to run through these. We don't want to spend too much time on them, but it's important for you to see what kind of things we're working on um, and how we're running these. So this is a, a site. This is Simpson MK, actually, the one I just mentioned earlier. So this is in Milton Keynes, right in the center of Milton Keynes. Um, we did have some planning issues with this one. It took a while to get through. We bought it off the council, and that's quite a recent picture. That's probably only last week. We stopped um, a few of these sites. We stopped because of um, COVID-19, but they're sort of working their way back on now. It's great that the government are back in construction. Um, so yeah, we're working our way back in with some subcontractors and that's kind of a, where we're at with that. But it's four houses, we use timber frame construction. Um, we're again with someone who came through our training program who provides timber frames and, and is doing some developments with Nick. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see it there. They're, these are sort of more 
Um, these are sale houses, although we do do a lot of build to rent, obviously. Um, there's four, um, four, uh, well, I'm getting confused now with all the sites. Four, four three beds, and no, four, four beds and one, no, four, three beds and one, four bed. Um, so, uh, yeah, so these are progressing now. There's one more to go up in a timber frame, and these will be completed in the next few months. Nick, do you want to move on to one of yours? Yeah, so, oh, sorry. So this one in the same sense is four four bedroom detached houses over in March in Cambridgeshire, which is sort of local to where I am. This one I'm with um, my partner Sunny Mahal and Stuart Horn on this one, as um, Adley alluded to, is um, Stuart does the timber frame side of things. So this is one of mine as such. Um, we should have been sort of completing roughly July, but due to the uh, COVID scenario, it's more likely going to be September now with the sort of holdups and as people are possibly aware, the, the issue with plastering, skimming and that sort of thing is uh, definitely causing us a few headaches, but we are progressing in some respects. We've got the electric connections on for all of them today. Um, then there's this one I've got on the go at the moment with another partner. This is a bank conversion, which is where I bought an ex-Lloyds Bank building. It's a grade two listed and we're just turning it into a flat upstairs, big two bedroom flat, uh, about 75 square meters, I think it is and then a decent sort of commercial unit downstairs so it's a range of different things that we're up to this particular one's one of andy's if you'd like to uh talk about that Andy. so kevin's taken the, the mick out of me in a minute because i've got that wrong it's actually three four beds and one five bed lloyd's corrected me on the chat so thanks for that guys yeah uh, we've got a lot going on at the minute <laughs> um, <laughs> you get how many houses um, there are <laughs> <laughs> So this one's uh, yeah, 12 houses, as Nick said. So this is in a, an area up in Cumbria, um, and we moved up and started working there in about 2015. We've got quite a lot of properties up there and a few live sites. So this was um, 12 houses. It was an old social club when we bought it, um, and we it had outline planning for eight. We knocked the social club down, enhanced the planning to 12, and um, as you can see, there's a few going up now. Again, we're using timber frame for this. Um, the site's progressing really well. And um, you know these are uh, these will be finished towards the end of the year. Yeah. So with this one, we had a variety of different issues to get over with ground contaminants and stuff like that. It wasn't a simple build, and it's all the different challenges that throw at you that make you uh, make you appreciate everything and learn for the next time, etc. So that's the, the the role of the project manager is always evolving. You don't know everything. You're never gonna know everything, but you work your way through every problem, and the more problems you solve, the easier it becomes. So this is another one of Andy's. Uh, I think um, the important thing with this, uh, the, the last one, this one, and the next one, these are all about four and a half hours away from us, maybe five hours from Nick, because Nick also lives about an hour away from, from where our office is. So a good important point with that one, though, is that he's been able to manage them remotely, and he's, he's managing all of the sites we're looking at here at one point. So a project manager just doesn't have to just work on one site at a time. You know, they've got site managers on each site who can um, sort of carry out the work that they're planning. So they can plan several, they can plan in different areas of the country. It doesn't have to be around the corners of them, um, but you need to know what sort of... Um, what sort of things you're working on, if you like. You need to know all the areas and aspects. There's quite a lot to it. Um, but like I say, you can work on more than one at, at once. So this is Lawson Street. This again is up in Cumbria. Uh, we bought this, originally it was five houses um, years ago. Then it was made into a couple of sort of solicitor's offices and solicitor's and accountants. It was derelict for quite a while. It's right in the center of town and the council owned it. And um, it was a bit of a blight on the landscape. So we ended up buying it from the council. Uh, we put planning in. We put planning. It, we could have got 12 flats into it, but um, Lloyd had the bright idea of building this big extension, which is the bit you're looking at on the back there, and um, it it turned it into 18 flats, added six flats. So that was a really good sort of um, bit of um, of foresight from Lloyd. Um, so um, yeah, so that um, that really worked well, and that one's pretty much finished now. Literally by the end of this month, that will be finished. And that's going to be um, rented out that one. So it, well, it's it's going into the um, assisted living sector. So there's a real need for that in that area, and it's going to be used for that. So it's really helping the community as well. Yep, exactly. So then there's this one, which is another one around the corner in the next town to that one. Okay. So yeah, this one is uh, one that we've been getting planning on for a while. Um, it is called Watery Lane. 
So we're actually buying this from the, the people who own the factory next door. It was an overspill car park for them. This is a real nice market town though. So some of the others were in um, more working towns. So they've got their own market there. But this is in, it's only down the road from there, but it's, um, it's a, a really nice market town with quite high values. So it was allocated in the local plan for 18 houses. So basically that means the council really wanted um, really wanted houses on this site to, to meet their demands and their quota, um, but they'd only got 18 on there. So we went to them and, and basically put an argument forward that we could fit a lot more on there and help them uh, get an even uh, bigger part of their plan through, if you like, their, their quota. And um, we've, we're, we've got the, in fact, you sent an email earlier about this, Nick, to say that the planning committee meeting is on the, in June, isn't it? Um, one of the days yeah, of June. The, um this one, the planning committee meeting that was going to get the decision date was literally the week of the COVID shutdown. So everything got shut down and we've been holding on for ages for this because it had a few complications with the nature of planning the world and uh, it got shut down the week we were supposed to get it. And so it was rather gutting. Yeah, um, but, but you yeah. know, that we're, we're, we're quite confident we're going to get a positive decision on this because we've been working with the planners and everyone else doing all the reports they need for quite a while on this. And, um, you know, they're being really positive now, aren't they, Nick? Yes, absolutely. And um, there's a couple of things we've helped them with as such because they, they forgot to ask us to do a couple of things. So we've done it nice and quick to be as uh, accommodating as possible. So we're, we're kind of in a, in a favoured scenario. We've done uh, feasibility and they did their own feasibility and they found that even with the feasibility scenarios uh, on the social element, uh, we, were, we were at a good level. So things are looking very favourable with this at the moment. Okay, next one. Then we've got these one here. Now this one, interestingly, is I'm main contractor slash project manager for this one. So this one's being done by my building company, Leading Projects. Now the nice thing about this one is it's a former white box um, trainee. Um, um, uh, Someone who's come through the white box uh, education program. Um, someone who was in construction, but not, um, not in this sort of capacity, owned a large tiling outfit, worked for a lot of developers, but never done anything like this for himself. And so when we were sort of working together on it, I found that I, uh, I was sort of helping him and it became quite a good scenario. That I took this on as a main contractor. So I've got lads there working. That's my own little digger there, look, sitting there in the middle of the photo. It's uh, four, uh, sorry, three houses. The first two that you can see are four bed, quite contemporary homes. And the last one's three bed. Um, they're about 600k. They're just uh, north of Saffron Walden in Essex. So nice little spot, lovely countryside near Audley End. And uh, it's very, very lovely little development, quite high, high finish to them. Yeah, I've been to see those actually um, at an earlier stage of development and they were really good actually. Yeah, so um, quite an exciting thing. And it's like, for me and Lloyd, it's like we're proud parents, you know, that we've, um, you know, we've shown Gary there how, you know, how to go forward a bit like Nick to go and do his own projects and, you know, to be going out and, and he's, he's going and smashing it now. So that's brilliant. Um, again, the, in the picture there, a couple of our uh, masterminders um, who have been through the, the white box education system, as Nick put it. Um, and this is one we're actually joint venturing with them on. Uh, it's in the local town just right up the road from us in Wellingborough. Uh, it's an old, old factory. It was an old shoe factory, then a steel factory. And, um, and actually it's been run down as you can see for a while. Um, we've got managed to get planning on it for, or it had planning, we've just altered the planning a bit and that's just come through again for 24 flats. So again, a great, um, a great um, project to get involved with, with the guys. Um, and you know, we're helping them go through the, the processes because you know, there's quite a lot to it when you're, as, you, as you'll see in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that one's uh, quite a busy one. This one, so we were talking about the three that I just did in Saffron Walden for uh, the contract, I'm, I'm main contractor for. This is another one I'm about to start for the same client. So um, gone from one to the next one. So the flow, the actual um, projects coming through now. So you've got one up for sale, one in planning, and this one is now going to be started. We did the um, foundations on this one about three or four months ago to uh, keep the planning in, uh, in line because it was about to run out. And uh, whilst the funding was all sorted out, done the phone funding through the partner Roma. So this nice, uh, nice scenario there. And uh, that one's about to kick off next month with a proper site scrape off now and uh, muck away to be able to start doing. It's uh, got two apartments and a house next to it. So it's a block of three. 
in one hit. We just landed the uh, welfare unit there last week, hence the photo. So um, there's a couple of people there just uh, mentioning on, especially the, the the last project about, you know, that yeah, Jim, that was the one that the guys presented at the network meeting and a couple of people have seen it on Instagram and things. Yeah, so that's one of our later ones. So yeah, you'll recognise that. And obviously we'll be following these through. But I think the... The, the great thing with those projects there is there's some real good variety. There's commercial conversions, there are different parts of the country. In fact, there's a spread all around the country there. They're all being managed by the same people. They're, you know, there are projects, either ours or, or Nick's himself or, or a combination of them. So, you know, they're actual projects that are going on. Now, you know, Nick's just said there that he was with Taylor Wimpy for 11 years, but he actually only started doing this himself in 2016. And, you know, we only started um, in 2014 as White Box and I was just a small building comp company doing extensions and whatever before that. So, you know, this is all very doable for you guys. Um, if you're in developments, if you're looking at project management developments, whatever, you know, there's one thing you can take confidence from is that, you know, we're just a little bit ahead of you. and We can, you know, show you through the processes the, the, the mistake by learning from the mistakes we made, you don't have to make them. So, you know, you're in a good position. So that's all well and good. Um, there's one common factor with all of those sites, though, is that, that there's obviously got to be builders, there's got to be architects, there's got to be that, but there's definitely got to be a project manager. Um, so what does pro project management involve? Lloyd, is that, that, sorry, Nick, if you can... Um, I'm masquerading as Lloyd, throwing you. Yeah, that's sorry. it. You've still got his name tag on your thing, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's four key stages in any project. So we've split them down here. We're going to take you through this in stages as well. Uh, there's a lot of information, so um, so we're going to take you through a couple of examples of this as well. But there's, we've broken them down into four um, four key stages, if you like. So we've got pre-project planning, and there's a whole group of um, subheadings on that, uh, which we will um, show you in a moment. Uh, we've got preliminary works that's split down to its own group of headings. Then we've got the construction phase and the post-construction phase so we're we're splitting them down into to four easy sort of digestible areas if you like we tried to um create modules to create uh chapters if you like of a journey and to things that you put into place at certain points to enable you to go to the next step of that journey now as you go through the points and the stages you'll find that some very much relate back to the beginning and you are ongoing with certain things such as the, the CDM side of things and stuff like that. But there's certain things you need to sort of arrange early doors, certain things you need to do during the construction and certain things you need to do post construction. So we've tried to break it down into that and give it headings. It's a very, very, very big subject to cover and we've tried to do it in the best sort of manageable way using resources that are widely available to most people. Okay, so we're going to run you through a couple of examples. So, um, firstly, in the pre, well, we're going to give you a couple of examples in the pre project planning stage. So, the first one is going to be time scales. So, this is a key part of what a project manager needs to do. Time scales are going to affect everything in a, develop in a development, they need to be created at the start and um, how the um, the chronology of the whole development is going to run, if you like, from conception and, and the offer stage through to completion. Uh, but then it's going to be monitored all the way through. It's going to have a feedback loop all the way through. So, Nick, do you want to talk us through um, how you would see timescales? Yeah, exactly. So if we um, go onto the, uh, onto the actual slides. So these are an extract of one of the modules that we use on the actual masterclass the the tools that we're, we're, we're sort of offering to you guys so um setting goals and building time scales is one of the modules in the pre-project planning section so goal setting so we've got to try and approximate time scales because when you're trying to focus a project that you can say oh yeah the build is going to take eight months and it's going to take two months for planning and it might take this and it might take that but why don't we get it down on paper and try and allow for all the different elements that you need to put in play and should we look at those and try and find a, a concise way of doing it to try and structure it? It might not work to the week, but at least if you have a plan, if you don't, what was the old expression? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So you, you put that in play, you start working at it. So look at the planning timescales and the actions to take, the funding timescales. 
So this is a nice little sheet that comes part of this course. Uh, this, sorry, I lose the course word. This toolkit, this uh, range of resources, okay? So this is a project planner, pre-construction elements, and it shows elements that you need to get in place. So one thing that a lot of people can forget and overlook, oversee, is that the construction phase on a site is maybe only a third of the site. You've got a, a decent chunk at the beginning of stuff you need to get done first before you even land on site. And then you've got the after construction period when you've got the completions, the refinancing, stuff like that. So looking at the first step. So this here is a sample schedule of 2020. You can see in the top line, the one to 52 of the weeks, the week commencing dates on the uh, blue colored line, the end of quarters in yellow. So just give you an idea where you are in the year. And then on the left hand column, you can see all the different things that we've got to look at. So um, when you look at the, uh, the actual project, so submit full proposal for review. So what we're doing there, well, you're, you're putting a proposal to the potential vendor. You're saying, well, look, this is what I can offer you. This is the terms I'd like to do it in, that sort of thing. You've got a period for the offer to be accepted. You've got a period where you need to appoint a solicitor and get their heads around it and get a heads of terms agreed with um, the potential vendor. So even just that little section, look there, that's near enough a six week window from when you get that play of putting the offer in to getting a heads of terms agreed. It can take longer than that, but this is an example scenario to sort of give you a bit of a way of looking at it. Then you've got purchase options agreed, you've got exchange of contracts time, uh, completion time. I've just put indicative times in there, but as you start to gain experience with your own legal teams, your own sort of scenarios and how quickly you can move on certain things, you can start to build this up in a bit more of a concise manner. You might in that period be doing a, it might be a site that you buy with full planning. So some of these elements are not as relevant. It might be a site that you're buying that's not got any planning on and you're doing it to a subject to finance and uh, subject to planning, sorry, scenario. So you might take an on-site architect appraisal, uh, get a scheme design, and then uh, start to look at um, getting funding in place, a so consultation with your bank. Then you might look at getting planning drawings put together planning drawings completed and then actually the planning stage so you can see there come April through to June I've got a planning submitted um, scenario and then I've got a sort of time of planning approved by third week of June that's that might be very ambitious so it might take 12 months to get planning but I'm just doing an example for now and then uh, development finance at the end of getting that into play and starting to push through because these things take a little while to come through these things take longer than you ever think because there's always another query from the finance company. They might want something like a collateral warranty that the architect's never seen one of those before and needs, needs a bit of help and coaxing to get through that element. You don't understand what these different titles I'm saying are, well then maybe this is a place for you to, to learn. So this is a good thing you're here. So um, these are all the different things that you might need to consider prior to getting on site, but it's not always an absolutely inclusive thing as someone's just noted in the uh, in the comments um, there may be contamination yeah absolutely Bob um, and I think I know what you're talking about there Bob if you're the Bob I believe you are um, and uh, yeah that that can really uh, put a spanner in the works hello Bob how are you um, right so um, moving on this one this one here Nick is um, this is your overall initial plan for the, the, the project if you like as you go into the project and you go through some of these phases, obviously you're going to have a, a site sort of schedule of works that you'd work towards, which will be a tighter version of the actual on-site part of it. But as you say, this, the, the actual on-site part for a project manager is only a, a proportion of it or a portion of it. So you're going to then use um, different tools and different spreadsheets to narrow down those works. And then they're going to be in a feedback loop because you're going to see what actually happens on site because that will be on a, a daily program and a weekly program, obviously. Um, and that will then evolve because you may get a rain day, you might get um, a delay on a timber frame being delivered or something like that. So that will be a, a, a living and breathing, moving um, product, if you like, throughout the whole of the development on it. That's it, exactly. These things are never set in stone. As much as you try to coordinate and we have to put a plan in place, these things do evolve and t change. And that's the whole point of managing the project. It's managing the different things that happen, such as COVID. Never saw that coming, did we? 
um, you know that the, you don't really plan for these things in a, and you've got to accommodate and adjust and and move down a different path you sort of I liken it to an athletics track or project it's a hurdles track you know you're running along and the first hurdle trips you over you bowl over you jump back up again you jump the next three the next one trips you over and so on and so forth. you just got to keep running you got to keep going forward you've got to keep jumping and finding ways over those hoops those hurdles to get to the end as the end goal and the people that can manage that process are the ones that will give the best get the best results um, a couple of things there so yeah um, Martin asked about what are the yellow columns um, it's been answered in the in the chat but just in case anyone's not looking at that they're quarters basically so every three months um, that just signifies the end of a quarter um, but this is quite you know this is on Excel this isn't um, this isn't crazy technology that no one's got a hand of um, a couple of people there are saying what what project management softwares, what tools you use, and all that kind of stuff. Now, I know that you and that, you know other people use crazy fancy tools and whatever, but you tend to stick to um, stick to sort of um, sort of uh, resources that people can get hold of. You know, you use Excel a lot. You you know you you you, you use things which are not expensive sort of monthly tools, don't you? Well, because we we work across so many different types of projects there's not one thing that i've ever found that fitted and i've tried lots of different software and different samples and different things but in the tools that i've learned from the days of the corporates and um the things that i've built up in my own time since i've been doing this i've sort of developed these things through excel through word through powerpoints through whatsapp groups and everything like i don't use anything that's out of the ordinary to the average person. It's, it's all stuff that can be quite easily used and modified to your own needs. Now, with that in mind, the Project Management Masterclass, I was obviously of a mindset of what could I do from that with actually um, producing stuff that people can use. And yeah, everything is in Excel. The, the information is all there. You can customize it to what you need, but it's all Excel, Word, simple documents. Okay, and cool. Um, Graham has put, uh, in fact, a couple of people have put that they use um, Microsoft Project and they're saying how good it is. So, you know, there are lots of solutions out there. Um, I suppose, you know, it's not a, a one size fits all. Um, we do lots of different variations of products. You know, you obviously make this work with several different, um, several different projects at the same time. So that's all good. So yeah, exactly. Everyone's hey. each their own and you, you get used to a system. You might find it brilliant. And yeah, Graham, we used to use Asta and that used to get used at Taylor Wimpy. But to be honest, I do the same thing with the Excel sheets that I dot and I can tweak it about as I need to. And it's, it's just for the use of the, the, the rest of people. And um, you, you have to look at it from another point of not everyone's from a corporate background or not everyone can deal and use certain softwares. So if you make it as simple as poss possible, especially when you're dealing with lads on site and project management on site, we on the sites that we have, we have on site project managers and they run the day to day uh, projects. So I'm never on a site running the actual day to day um, stuff. I'm coordinating it from afar. And those guys uh, aren't always the most IT. Uh, they're not IT illiterate. That's an unfair thing to say, but IT isn't always their strongest point. So if I give them a simple process to use and say, look, you can block that out, move that there, you can report that like this and do that like that, it's, an, it's a nice, easy way to work with it. So um, that, was a, so that was just an extract on the timescale section that we were doing from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the masterclasses modules. Okay, so um, it might be worth just going back into a couple of these questions while we're here before we move on to another one. Um, there was a couple, let me just go back. Um, so there's a question about how do you find a great project manager who keeps the project to time and, and know where to save costs? Where is that one? I didn't see that one. Um, I'm just looking right. Oh yeah, from Yanushka. Yeah. Um, how to find a great project manager who keeps the project to time and know where to save costs? So again, it's, um, are you looking from a complete starting point and you don't know anyone is to perhaps research uh, firstly research quantity surveying companies in your area quantity surveying companies um, estimators they quite often uh, do project management services 
look at um, other construction companies and see who they're using, get advice from them, spread the word out on the old white box property developer secrets group. You know, there's 20,000 people there nearly. Someone's going to know someone in that area who does a good job for them and they're going to have some recommendations. That always works, it seems, for building contractors in various areas too. Um, so, um, architects and people like that, they offer this as a service as well. Yeah, um, you know, what we're saying is that uh, uh, so somebody is going to need to be managing your project. So, you know, if you haven't got the, the skill level, then you need to either upskill or you need to find someone who's got that. So um, that's kind of where we're at with it. So um, just check. Um, do you want to move on to the next one? I'll keep an eye on the questions and um, we'll maybe do a few more after that. So next, this is the next one we we're looking at. This is a, another module from the uh, from what we were talking about. So um, this is the specification. So when you're looking at a development early on and you are about to go out to price a development, you've got contractors looking at it, etc. You need to get a benchmark specification in place because you want to make sure you're tendering correctly to the different contractors that are going to be doing the work for you. And so therefore, setting out a specification that's relevant to the project in the first instance is a very, very key point. I've got an example document I'm going to show you, which is um, one that comes as part of what we're doing here tonight. So um, effectively, you want to ensure that you're tendering correctly. The potential purchasers know what they're getting when they're we're looking at things lately. And when you have CGI's created, they resemble the plots you are building because you've given a specification over to all these people because you've set it out from the word go. You also will have a specification set so your funders know the level of the product that you are producing. So um, this is a, you need to ensure that it's correct for the setting. So let's say you're building, um, I don't know, you're building some uh, flats in a reasonable area. You're not gonna be perhaps put in high level granite worktops and things like that. You wanna put um, reasonable levels of kitchens in and tiling, stuff like that. But on the flip side, you're building um, some rental units in a, um, in, a, in a small town, that sort of thing. You're not gonna go crazy on those, but let's say you're building a high end plot in central London, you're probably gonna put all the bells and whistles on it. But if you have a decent specification set up, you have a plan going forward, then everyone who's pricing that is going to price it to the same sort of level. They're going to price it to uh, a level that you've requested in the materials that you've asked for, so they all know. So if you didn't put a specification to a builder, um, to contractors, and they were just taking it from the working drawings, one builder contractor is going to come in at, let's say, a million, and he's going to be allowing for X, Y, and Z and another uh, contract is going to come in at 1.5 million because he's allowed for something completely different. But if you try and get everyone on a happy margin, a happy medium, because you've told them the building regulation drawings and then you've given them a full specification, you're going to be a lot more closer in what you're going to achieve. So we've included a spec in what we we're looking at tonight for a spec for use for rental and for mid-range. And the rental spec, we are potentially not selling these. So whilst you build them to a reasonable level, you put in what is necessary rather than over excessive products as are set examples of high finished tiles or granite worktops. And the sales spec, you look at the competition in the area. So match or make yours a little nicer, for example, spotlights in all the wet areas perhaps, or integrate appliances. If you look at um, other developers in an area and build up a specification that's relevant to the area, to the, uh, to the sort of price of what you're building. So when we, um, when we look at this, we, especially with some other people who come through the courses and stuff, they, it's very tempting to spec all your properties highly, but in HMO, look at more solid finishes and durable products as you will not want to make, make replacing stuff all the time. Look at perhaps showers, uh, look at the shower walls for panelling rather than tiling. From a maintenance point of view, they're far easier to clean. So things that last a bit longer, they don't go green with rot and stuff like that. So um, for a sales unit, are you including flooring? For a rental unit, you would, but that would be for a sales unit. You may not to allow people to do what they want to do, or you might put an upsell on it as an extra. If you look at every main developer, one of the, the big things they do is they put margins on um, all the little extras. I think someone like 115 quid per spotlight, you know, that sort of thing. And that's where you can make a decent margin as a developer doing extra elements um to achieve a, a better margin for yourselves 
So you might cost you 2K to floor something, for example, but you could possibly sell it for 20, 30% margin. So, you know, you start to make a little bit of profit elsewhere, not just on the actual properties themselves. So other things that you might want to consider when you're looking at the landscaping specifications, um, the landscaping, uh, you'd sort of, Generally, you turf the rear garden and a small amount of planting out front. You wouldn't go, someone said to me, oh, why, why are you not planting out the rear garden with a whole bunch of landscaping and stuff? And I'm not going to spend two or three grand on that because it's probably not going to make the house worth any more. There's relative levels to relative things to what you're doing. Um, we, we do example specs for, and show homes from mainstream developers and imitates. And, Mainstream developers spend thousands on research. They target markets, everything like that. You don't need to do that. You can imitate what they do and then make it a little bit nicer to make your, to make your product the, uh, sell the best way it can. So I'll just bring up a document that we, we're gonna look at. So just bear with me a sec, I'll click over to this. So this is a house spec form document that we have. So this here is, uh, Andy, can you see that okay? Because obviously I can't see if everyone's seeing it okay. Yeah. Um, so this one is a, a simple document where we list every element into what goes into a home. And so you might do your working document, uh, working uh, building regulations drawings, but this is a document that goes alongside it, the specification you set out from the word go. So you literally put in there what you're having, so that with number four there, Full central heating, what is it going to have? Radiators, underfloor heating, what boiler you're going to have? Cylinder, you have a bit of feedback from your plumbers and options on that. Look at the power sockets, how many sockets you're having per room. So you can set these things out from the word go. So when your electrician's price, you know exactly what's going on. Um, you look at uh, TV entertainment, fiber optics, things like that. You put in carbon monoxide alarms to make sure you're relevant to. Uh, to uh, the safety specs and things like that. Internal features, what doors are you putting in? Windows, PVC double units, are they gonna be gray in the, the new fashion at the moment or are they gonna be something else? The skirtings you're putting in, you get the full detail of everything that uh, goes into there and you can customize this to yourself, to your, exactly what you need. And as I said earlier, everything I've done here, Excel, Word, very easily to be transferred and everyone can read it when you send it to them. You send it in a, another, sometimes in other um, softwares and people can't open it, haven't got that software, that sort of thing. So simple software, simple scenario. External paving look, I've even thought about what I'm putting in for um, the front paths, the rear patios, what fencing I'm doing, gardens, what am I allowing for, turfing, rotary dryers, garden sheds, am I putting these things, communal areas for apartments, etc., and apartments only. So these are all the points and I put examples in certain places. This is just a nice little neat document, again, that can be used to achieve the uh, level that you want to achieve within a, a project and uh, a property in, in total. You can customize that on a plot by plot basis as well. You may have some two bedroom houses that you're specking at one level and some five bedrooms specking at another level. We, we often, when we are about to start a project and we're, when I say start a project, I mean start all the in, uh, internal sort of discussions relating to the project we we have a sit down meeting with all the partners now if not every site will be the same partners and different people will have different inputs to put in and you can sit down and sort of thrash out what everyone wants and this gives you a nice sort of level to go right what are we doing about this what we're we doing about that what are we doing about the other and it gives you a sort of starting point to really think about these things where you might not have had that before so um, just while we're on that, um, just to warn you as well, Nick, just uh, I'm going to run through a few questions now, but in a moment, I'm going to ask you to bring in um, a traffic management plan example as well. So just uh, so you can get one of those from um, mm -hmm. that we've been talking about before as an example, um, just because that's another important role for the project manager. So there's a couple of questions here. So Cristiano, there was uh, one about do we tender or do you look for three to four or three or four contracts of tender in? Yeah, that's about the right number. You'd put a comprehensive tender pack. Now that would be again the project manager's role. They would put that tender in pack together and um, they would put it out to the contractors. The tender in pack would have detail like this specification in it um, because it's very, very important that you deal with that and give them what you want them to quote on and tender on because obviously if you haven't given them your your specification they're going to there's um, ambiguity there and they're going to fill in the gaps 
when someone else is making those decisions for you, that's when, for one, you're not going to get like for like costings and you could be making your decision on, you know, bad information. And for two, they could, you know, they could, they could just be putting the cheapest products in or whatever, you know, so um, you, you need to have control of that. So that all gets done by the project manager. Um, then um, Ada, um, you said about the specification, who would work with you to get such a level of detail, the quantity surveyor, the surveyor or the architects. Um, basically, it's the project manager's role who's going to do that. Now, not everyone considers the project manager as in a role like Nick Scott. They may have a smaller site, or whatever, but somebody is project managing that site, whether you like it or not. Whether it be the owner, who's a self-developer, and they're just sort of working the way through it and working with those people. Um, it could be the architects doing it for you. Obviously, that's going to come at a cost. It could be a, a quantity surveyor, but somebody is guiding the project in the, the areas that we're talking about. Um, even if they're not being labelled as a project manager. Um, how does a project manager deal with a contractor that does not build to the benchmark specifications and other conflict, uh, colour cost conflicts? And do you supply building materials to the contractor to cut their margins? Or what do you think is the best way of managing build? Look, there's no one size fits all to this. It's what suits the the team of people that are being put together to do that, that development and it depends the size of the development, the budgets, all of those kind of things. But the project manager would put those in, those options together, if you like, for the, the developers, if he's not the developer himself. So Nick would come to us and he would say, look, you know, how are we going to approach this project? Um, you know, what kind of team are we going to put together? The, the bit that at the start, if you've got a, a, a builder that's not playing um, playing the game and doing it to the right benchmark, that should be managed out before you ever get onto site. You know, you should be picking the right builder by going through the right contractual process, the, the right, you know, so we would do JCT contracts, for instance, um, and it would all be listed out what we expect from the builder, um, and it would all be signed up both ways. Now, it's important to note there that a JCT contract, which is the standard contract that you would do um, with a, a, a main contractor or a builder or any kind of works, even if you were have an extension at your home, you could have a simple version of that. Um, but that's there and designed to protect both parties. It's not for the developer to screw over the builder, if you like, and get a really cheap price and then, you know, um, and, and not pay them at the end. It's to protect that the, the, the developer gets the right job against something like this specification and all the tender pack that's already gone out there that they get what's been quoted for, if you like. But on the flip side of that, it also protects the builder because if they've given the tender and, and the, the right price and they've done what they said and they actually execute that work in the way they said they were going to, then it protects that they'll get the payments and the stage payments that they agreed at the start of the contract to. Uh, it's not their problem if, the, um, if the, the, the funding was delayed for some reason or whatever else. I mean, it doesn't mean you won't work together, but you know they, they were due the money that they've spent. They could have spent a, a, a lot of money out to get to that point, if you like. So um, that's all part of the role of the project manager. They're there to manage the, the site. And, and that's why Nick can do it um, off-site. He doesn't, he's not the, you know, the distinction is that he's not the site manager. He's not there just telling the trades what to do every day. He'll have, he'll have instigated that. He'll have chosen those trades. He'll have worked with the site manager and he'll work with the site manager every day. But it is a distinctly different role. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Nick, before I move on to other questions? No, to be fair, you covered, you covered most of that. I did notice there was a couple of points um, that I saw on the uh, questions as well. Um, I think the, uh, where was it? There was someone that was asking, specification, who would work to get such a level of detail, the quantity surveyor or architect? Well, Ada, that one is a simple answer, really. This These... This specification element wasn't the construction build element. This was the finishing schedules, finishing specification we were looking at there. So this is the stuff that you're going to put into the house as a finish, not the stuff that creates the fabric of the house that the architect's doing. But absolutely, when you're looking at the architect side of things and the structure, you may decide to do different forms of build. We can talk about that later if you wish with like timber frames and traditional build and stuff like that. But that's where you do discuss that with the architect. When you go through the quantity surveyor, you're looking at getting them to do all the meterages, to do all the levels of amount of materials that are going into that to be able to then cost that out on a, an average price for that area, for that level of detail. Okay, so um, somebody else just quickly asked about electric charging points. Um, 
So we, we do it on a site specific basis. Um, we don't necessarily just put it in as a, as a, a uh, every site because some of ours are sort of more lower cost rental properties and for specific markets like um, uh, assisted living, like I just said there, and they don't actually have that many cars. Um, but sometimes that's coming in more and more as a planning consideration now. So that could be a, that could be a planning condition. So yeah, you put um, around a thousand pounds each. Yeah, I mean that you can buy them a lot cheaper than that. There's obviously variances where you can get, but um, also you've got to include all the cabling and wiring and whatever. So yeah, I'd suggest probably a thousand pounds each would definitely cover it. Um, Nick, the only now, thing, like the only thing do... I'd add to that. Sorry, the, the only thing I'd add to that on the it. The, the trouble with um, electric car charging points is not every cap fits all. The, it's not like a 13 amp plug you have in the wall. You might have a Tesla that has a completely different plug to a Nissan uh, Leaf or whatever it might be. So you, when I, I've done it on those three I showed you at Sapp and Walden and all it's, we've done is allowed the um, feed directly from the consumer unit and it's on the outside of the house on a, on a, on a sort of um, a box ready to go for someone to fit their own unit, which might be about two, three hundred pounds for the actual unit that goes on the wall. So I've done it on a few, yeah, but we don't allow it as standard unless it's a stipulation by planning at the moment, but it's a relatively easy thing to modify in later on if needs be. Okay, um, right, I just want to, there's a few more questions coming in, but I don't want, we can do questions at the end as well and I'll bring them in every now and again. Um, Nick, I just want to show another aspect to the project manager. Uh, it's not in the slides, so that's why I just gave you a heads up on it. But if you can bring up the traffic management plan uh, and just give us an idea of, again, another aspect that people perhaps wouldn't consider. Um, this is actually our site for 12 houses that we mentioned earlier. Um, so, yeah, talk us through what this document is and, you know, why you've put it together and what the objective of the document is. So when people are looking at new sites, you might notice, let's say you, you're looking at a site that's got planning permission and the site's got planning permission and it says a strategy for the traffic management of ins and outs of a site and how you're doing that is got, has got to be submitted as part of the planning uh, conditions. Let's say condition three says you need to submit this for getting the conditional sign off. So first stage is that. Second stage is when you've actually got people on site, you want to get people around site in the safest manner possible. You want to create a safe environment. There's an old slogan of, we all want to go, basically, a lot of the, a lot of, I've forgotten the actual word of the slogan now, but basically you want to go home safe at night and you can only achieve this together. And, and, and effectively, it is exactly that. You want to be able to allow people to get in safely, get out safely, and not walk in the moving areas that you're designated a certain working zone. So on this one here, this is when we were first starting on site. So we had somewhere to deliver the materials right next to the road there so that we could reverse a truck straight in using a banksman perhaps. And then we had a site car park, which is a separate area to where the actual materials are being stored so that hopefully no bricks and blocks would fall on someone's precious vehicle. You've got a pedestrian access there on the right hand side so that they can get to the welfare unit, which you should be supplying under CDM regs, or you should definitely make sure there's a provision for it. There's certain regs to follow with that. Um, there's a hardcore pile there, so you can see that's segregated from where we're actually working. And that's the last bit we're doing of the site. So we'll use that hardcore and utilize that across the site before doubling back onto that area. And these things are working documents. They're on the wall in the welfare unit. They're positioned so that any operative or any visitors to the site can see what's going on, where they should and shouldn't be walking, a safe method to do that. So um, that's what a traffic management plan is all about. So you've effectively got the CDM from the start, from um, doing it with the planning conditions to the CDM element of running it through the um, development. If anyone doesn't know what CDM is, as I say, it's the Construction Design and Management Regulations 2015. They're basically the safety regulations that govern the, the whole industry of what you do in construction and um, the safe working practices that you should be adhering to under the legal requirements of the law. Um, so that's the, the, that's why you do a traffic management plan. And it's quite a nice thing is this is quite a simple site. Um, it gets very technical when you have to have uh, moving areas for forklifts, um, perhaps, but you obviously don't want um, pedestrians to interact where that forklift is shunting around. 
um, and so you perhaps put walking areas to the rear of properties and what we call loading bays to the front where we load out the materials that the different guys need for doing the different tasks and um, you try to create as much um, segregation between walking operatives vehicles moving about and uh, where you do have that you have people called banksmen who are trained to guide the uh, lorries around as needed and might wear a special high vis for that purpose so everyone knows what they're up to at certain times because we don't want accidents of lorries reversing over people that's not a good look okay so um you know as you just mentioned there this is um part of cdm 2015 um, CDM is a massive subject and you know there's no way we could do it justice on a webinar tonight but just give us a little bit of an overview of some of the roles within CDM and um, just talk through what some of the some of the, the, the highlight roles are and uh, you know a, a very brief description of what their roles and responsibilities would be okay so um, the sort of main role firstly is the developer and the developer has the role of ensuring that everyone that you've, you've got everything in play to be able to do things safely on your site. So you would just hire someone such as a principal designer. Now a principal designer is basically in charge. It can be your project manager, it can be a safety consultant, it can be architect, it can be you if you've got a reasonable level of competence to be able to do that role. And basically they are in charge of coordinating all the safety on that site. So they may not work on that site, they may not, um, actually be involved in the day-to-day -day, but they coordinate the safety and set it up in a way and monitor it in a way so that it's it's within the rules and regulations you've got the designers so the actual architects structural engineer they have a, res a role under cdm to try and design out risk to mitigate risk before um before you get anywhere near actually building it so the idea is that you design something that can be built and put a risk assessment and method statement in to uh, mitigate any issues and build it in the safest manner so um, you um, you uh, what's the word I'm looking for now so then you, the next thing is the contractors and a main contractor and their responsibilities under it are to ensure that their their guys are basically doing everything they should and they've got the right welfare in play which comes back to the developer to make sure that they're working with the developer to make sure that the right welfare is in in play for the various guys on site. This is very, very loose um, elements of it because there's so many different elements to go through. Um, and then you've got the actual lads themselves on site and how their, their responsibility is to make sure that they report any issues, they know the rules and regulations they're supposed to be working under and they're adhering to it from a safety point of view. Okay, thank you. Look, I don't want to confuse people on, on, a, on the webinar, but you know, it's important that people understand that it, it's a very, um, important job of a project manager to understand all the things that are going on the site there's lots of moving parts all the time and um, you know it's, you're controlling or you're the you're the puppeteer if you like aren't you you're controlling yeah. all of the different elements of the site all of the, the different people are working there you're working with a developer if you're not a developer yourself and or you know you could be the planners the funders all of it all of the different elements to make make that end product at the end of the day and that's what you did for 11 years with Taylor Wimpy, and that's what you're doing for us and on your own sites. Um, so, but there is an opportunity for you guys, if you, um, if you just want to move on on the original slides, yeah, please. Please. there's an opportunity for you guys to, um, to maximise that, if you like, and, you know, there is an opportunity to earn whilst um, you're doing that role, because somebody has to definitely do that role on, um, on every one of the sites. So if you just um, click forward again, please, Nick. So um, just, to, just bring that all up. So um, a project manager is going to work throughout the entire of the project. So you know all of those elements from pre-project planning, um, preliminary works, construction phase, and, um, and after construction, is, is all managed by the, the project manager throughout. And that, like I say, every project is going to have a project manager. Um, you know, there's no facet of, of, um, of anything that any product that is made, any, any team that works that hasn't got a manager. You know, you don't just expect people, you don't just throw people together uh, and expect um, a result at the end. Somebody in any, um, any walk of life is always managing that and it's no different on a building site. So if we move forward on the slides there, Nick. So what is um, the, the project manager's primary two roles are to keep your 
um, to keep your development and your project on budget and on time. And all of the facets that they're going to do and all of, the, um, all of their daily tasks, if you like, and everything they set up is to keep your, budget, uh, keep your project on budget and on time. Because those things are what's going to control whether it's a, a successful project or not at the end of the day. Now, as I say, every project has got someone doing that. Um, you just might not be titling them up as a project manager at this point. As you, as you go into bigger projects, then you know, this is a role that is going to be recognized by funders, um, even private, uh, private funders as well as development funders. And also, you know, that anyone who is, is going to be um, reliant on that. So any of your power team who comes and work, they're going to work with the, the project manager. They're going to want to see that professionalism. They're going to want to see that um, somebody is controlling it to that level. If we can move forward again. Sorry, we can't both control the slides. So, um, so, so a couple of people have asked about, you know, what does a project manager get paid? Um, you know, how does it work against the budget? So this is just a very loose example that you, there's no one size fits all to it. But if you've got, say, a build budget of a thousand pounds and you've got a time scale of maybe a project like that might take 18 months. So that's not a 12 month project. That's an 18 month project. Uh, a project manager could get um, that would be that would equate to six percent of the total build budget so a little bit like architects sometimes a project manager would be charged um, against the build cost um, so they're not going to be necessarily working all day every day on that project as, as we've just discussed there nick, nick work, works probably on six of ours five or six of ours he's got two or three of his own so he's working on at any one point maybe eight projects um, it, depending on the level of work that they're going to be working on those projects would be um, dependent on how much they would get paid but just um, talking about an opportunity for you guys, if it was in this scenario here, 6%, that would be fully project managing a project, obviously, um, and seeing it through. Um, a wage per month on that would be 3,333. Again, this is just an example to give you an idea. This is an opportunity where some of you guys who are perhaps even doing this role for somebody else, or you know, you've perhaps done your own projects before and maybe not called yourselves a project manager, um, but you could access you know, obviously that, that, that level, that, um, that part of the budget, if you like, is already agreed with the funder. Nobody, there's not a funder out there who won't um, agree to a project manager being on the site because you've got to think that that funder has got a first charge on your development and your site um, to give you the thousand, uh, sorry, the million pounds in your budget there. They need to know that that's being looked after properly. So you'll never get um, a QS or a, a funder out there who argues with having a professional project manager on the, on the team because they know that that's a key role which will keep you on time and keep you on budget, those two key um, facts. So um, I need to move my box because I can't see whether things are coming up, my chat box. So um, on this one here at £3,333 per month um, and then on this one we've given an example here. So taking off the 60,000 that the project manager's been paid, uh, and by being efficient, they've, um, we've suggested they've perhaps saved an extra 10,000, but even if they bring it in on budget, that's brilliant. Um, but someone of that, uh, at, at that cost is gonna be someone who's pretty proficient. We're not saying that, that every project manager's gonna cost you that, but you know, certainly the, um, you're paying for experience. So it's, um, it, you perhaps wouldn't go for the cheapest architect, the cheapest planning consultant, um, uh, the cheapest builder so you probably wouldn't go for the, the cheapest project manager too because you know you want someone who knows what they're talking about like Nick um, so the next one there well, there's just, a, the just a caveat to that as well um, it depends uh, a project manager and how much you pay yourself is how much involvement there is in the project let's say your uh, project managers visiting once a month to do an audit visit it's going to be a very different cost to someone who's there full time running that project for you and that's their only focus so that cost fluctuation varies entirely on the project and what's going on but for this example's sake this is showing how you could earn out of your own development if you were managing it that 60 grand take away your tax take away your national insurance all that sort of stuff equates to around three it's about 40k take home after you've allowed for all that other stuff so that's where that must make sense if anyone's looking at that thinking well that doesn't add up to 60 grand that's the, the mentality behind that to show the reality, the, the real term scenario. Okay, so on this one, we're showing that, um, that it saved the, the 10,000, as we said. 
So, you know, well, what we're trying to show you, obviously, is a webinar. It's only, a, you know, we've, we've only got an hour or an hour and a half to show you that, the, you know, what the project management role um, entails. And um, what, you know, what we've already highlighted is it's quite an intense and it's quite an in-depth role. So, you know, some of you have come on because you've heard that we've got the, the project management masterclass. So the project management masterclass, it solves all of these issues for you. So um, it, if you were looking at that thinking, well, I haven't got, you know, I've done a few projects myself, but I haven't quite, I don't know all of those things that we talked about. And there's obviously that, that's just an example. We showed you there was 50 different boxes under all of those four um, sub, uh, there was 50 sub headings under all of those four main headings there. And, you know, you probably don't even know what they are yet, let alone how to go through them. So the project management masterclass is what me and Nick have put together to solve all those answers for you and show you what you would need to look after to run over up, run a project yourself. Um, also, if you had a main contractor or another project manager to show you what they should be doing so that you can be checking on them and making sure they're keeping that cost to budget and the time that are those two important factors that we said about. So Nick, what, um, just move on the slide, what is the project management masterclass? So there's those four headings, the pre-project planning, the preliminary works, the construction phase, and the post-construction. There's all of the boxes filled out. So some examples there, we went through timescales, went through specifications, but just in pre-project planning, you've also got um, a structural engineer you will have to work with and get a quote from and um, work with the best solution to build the, the actual product that you want. You've got to work with building control to make sure that your um, the, uh, the, the, the what you're building actually um, adheres to the regulations that we need to build to in this country. You're working with the QS to get all the costs right. There were some people talking about costs of cost per square foot in different parts of the country. You know, the project manager is going to work very closely with the builder and the QS to work out that cost per square foot and make sure that the original quotes and the tenders are in the right um, in the right area. And it doesn't always mean the cheapest is the um, is the best. You've got to get services on site, warranties, tendering. Um, you've got the architects, build methods, funding, stage phases, supplies. There's so much, and that's just in one of the areas. Um, Nick, just talk us through um, preliminary work, some of the, the works that you'd be looking at in there. Yeah, so the bottom line is with all these different titles, we were, oh, uh, where's those lines coming from? Who's managing to draw over this? Um, this is not me, by the way. Um, with all these different titles, we were trying to give you a, a basic overview of every element so you knew where to go and do things, when to go and do things, where you get further information on those things, examples of those different elements. Um, when you say preliminary works, we're looking at what needs to be insured what should be insured to be able to do that uh, particular uh, program uh, project where we're, we're talking at land insurance, the contractors or risk insurance, things like that, the CDM element, who is responsible for what? And then that links into a lot of different other boxes. So the health and safety on site and the day-to-day -day management, the risk assessments, what that, what are they? If you've never dealt with a risk assessment before, we'll give you a basic overview of a risk assessment, give you an example on how to write your own risk assessment for a specific job and where to go and get someone to do risk assessments for you if you feel it's something you don't want to do yourself. But as a project manager, you, as a, someone who's running this site, you need to have ensure these are things in place. And if your contract's not able to do it, where can I go to do that? Well, here's an option that we give you. Here's an option of a contractor or a company that can produce a risk assessment for you. Here's an online service that can do it, that sort of thing. We look at phase plans with actual, the, the construction phase plan. This is a requirement, again, under planning conditions you have to put in to place and how to write one of those, all the different things you need to think of and then submit into planning conditions and how to deal with architects and work with the different teams and uh, specific um, experts to deal with a different thing like you might have ecological issues or archaeological issues that sort of thing so all these different things we're we're giving you an intro a way to look at these different things um so the next phase is the construction phase so you know we haven't even got as nick said um the, the being a project manager the actual spade in the ground delivering the site is only well i think you described it as a third of it um earlier so you know this is where we're getting into that now so the site setup and um, the welfare units what we need to provide for our workers the site strip off site security how we're keeping everything safe um, and stopping people from stealing everything on there um accident reporting scheduling of materials calling off the services so we've set them up in a previous um, preliminary works but then we've got to call them off at the right time on site the inspections um, for building control, 
and um, warranties, but we've got the health and safety checks, audits on site, so, um, safe selling and um, gas safe and the NIC EIC. So the, the, the gas safe and the, the electrical compliance of your subcontractors. Yeah, you see, a lot of people don't know what even those things are. So we're giving you an understanding of what they all are and what you're to look for when you're employing these people to do these different roles. Uh, do you want to just run through quickly post-construction as well, Nick? So post-construction, we're looking at the actual finer finishes, the snagging, the, the stuff that needs to be done right at the end to ensure you're getting the best product, the practical completion certifications, what you need to have in place to achieve these. So, um, for example, say you need to get the sign off from the electricians, the sign off from the air testing, the sign off from sound testing, maybe you need to have an EPC and an SAP in place, which we refer back to an earlier module for that. So all these different things that you need in place, sign offs, um, survey and how, how, how to deal with surveyors and agents and safe manner of working with these guys. Um, things that you all need to put in place to be able to deliver the end of that project. Okay, so if you can move to the next slide, please, Nick. So, in essence, what we've tried to do and what we have done is um, we've put 11 years of, uh, or 13 years of Nick's experience now um, and 13 years of my experience of owning a building company and going through all of the experiences that we've had and project managing myself, we've put them all together and we've encum encompassed them into this resource package. Um, is that not moving forward, Nick? Sorry. Um, Sorry Nick. Um, yeah. So we've put them forward into this resource package. Um, we've created, and we're just literally finishing this off. We've been doing it whilst we've been in lockdown. This has been our sort of lockdown project, if you like. Um, 50 instant access videos. So um, this isn't necessarily um, a course as such. It's instant access videos covering all of these um, packages and subheadings that we've just said there and it covers all aspects of project management everything that should be considered it opens up to you know um, videos which talk you through the whole process uh, they're ranging from 15 minutes to 45 minutes per video um, so there's probably over 30 35 hours of content there and they're all backed up with the relevant paperwork and files so you know the the traffic plan the um, the specification, the, everything that you know, you've seen a couple of files there tonight. Every uh, there's basically a file for all of those things that, that has got it um, from Nick's experience and my experience. So somebody's just asked there. I think Bob asked there. So is it a, a time limited thing? Um, if you if you decide to take on the, the the masterclass, you'll get that information forever. The whole point of it is it's a resource that when you go through any development you can take this product through with you and it will prompt you in every area. So you can, from the pre-construction phase, you get a new project, you go back to square one again and you say, right, have I considered this? Have I considered that? If it's not you, if you've got a project manager on it, have they considered this? Have they considered that? You can ask the right questions to make sure they're keeping your, your project on time and on budget, those two key things. So if you didn't know that, then you're not gonna ask those questions. So this will prompt you to do that. If you do do it yourself and um, you project manager, this will help you upscale from maybe even doing, you know, previously you might have done HMOs or a small build or something like that. You'll be able to run multiple sites using this resource. Um, so if you did that, then obviously you'll be able to pay yourself as we suggested, you know, whatever the figure might be, um, you'll be able to pay yourself through it. So you'll be able to get um, a wage throughout it, which is, as I say, will be in order that it's not an extra wage, it's a, a wage which is paid throughout the construction to a project manager, whether it be you or not. So that's the way that you can access on developments from day one. Um, obviously you will have to be able to do the job. You can't just say, right, I'm gonna be a project manager and then, you know, blag it all the way through without any any support because, you know, you, you will need a, a project like this unless you, you know, unless you're like Nick and you've done this, um, you know, you've done this tens of tens of times before, then you, you'll know all this. Um, but if you don't, then you'll need a resource like this to prompt you way through. There's quite a lot to remember. So that's um, that's what me and Nick have been up to. This this has been developed to solve those issues for you and to, to help you through and save you the money. So um, if you can flip through to the next slide for me, Nick, please. So going back to the, the four key stages of any project, pre-planning, 
preliminary works, the construction phase and post-construction, we cover all areas of all of those. So the boxes are too small to see what they would have been in there, but all of those areas, there's modules on everything that you've got on there. So Nick, you can bring that up. So we've put all this together. I'd say it's taken 35 hours of recording or 30 to 35 hours of recording. That's the recording part of it, let alone collating all the information, putting it all together, um, getting it edited at the back end, putting all of the resource sheets together. And um, in fact, Nick, can you just tell us um, what um, some of the sort of uh, the sheets that will go alongside this, what, um, what kind of resources will be um, given to the people who have this? So to help everyone, we put in examples of all sorts of different things, which I'll start to list in a second. And we put in documents you can use, such as the program one I showed earlier. So for example's sake, I've got sample service layouts, sample service quotes, BT layouts, broker examples, so things of information that brokers are going to need when you're trying to set up funding. Perhaps you've never set up funding before. It's all the things that people are going to ask, all the different things, and then an explanation to those different things. I've done examples of risk assessment, development facilities examples. I've done uh, example annual programs for site, day-to-day programs, example F10s. Do you know what an F10 is? Well, you will now. You'll be able to understand what that is, where to go and get one of those. Uh, weekly programs, gas quotes, house spec forms, induction presentations to induct your guys onto site, insurance broker recommendations and examples of the insurance you need. Um, I've got examples in there of QS reports, so how a QS breaks down their, their um, report for a site. I've got examples of method statements, planning portal resource links. I've got planning programs for various sites example quotes from architects and how they, they look at the job, all the structures of their REBA pricing, for example. I've got structural engineers quotes in there. I've got other things like good finishes guides. I've got links to other reference materials around different um, materials and manufacturers recommended finishes, samples of what you should have as an end result um, and completed forms in all different shapes, shapes of the different things that you might need to order or book during the site and how we've completed the form because I quite often when it goes back to even um, mentees that come through the white box thing they'll say oh how do I fill this out well I've done an example of how it's filled out how I have filled it out and how you can then use that and uh, do it for your own thing like how do you calculate how much water usage in the house I've shown where you do that how much um, energy uh, uh, sorry where do you get an EPC what is an EPC what is an SAP I've given examples of EPCs and SAPs there's a lot a lot of documents in there okay so look you know there's a lot of comments coming in saying how comprehensive it sounds um, you know that we've gone to town on this James has just said now James is on a development he knows exactly what we're talking about with all of these things and he's managing it himself so you know he understands that now that list of documents that Nick's just read out there is worth more than 600 pounds as it is um, not only do you get that, you get all of the, the, the module videos and resources to tell you how to use all that stuff. You've literally got me and Nick on a slideshow like this talking you through um, personally how we've done it and our examples and how you can not make those mistakes that we've made in the past, which you know have cost us money. So we don't want you guys to make, make those same mistakes. So you can learn from our experiences. Now, you know, physical courses are obviously much more than 600 plus VAT. Um, but you know we've tried to do this understanding what um, what the struggles are for people at the moment. We've had our sites shut down, as I'm, I'm sure many other people have. So we want this to be an affordable product, so you guys can go and develop safely and keep the time and keep the budget. Uh, Nick, if you can move to the next slide, please. Sure. So. All of the information you can see, um, it's backed up with a brand new website that Lloyd's put together as well, easily accessible. Uh, you get this stuff for life. So, you know, you go back and use it time and time again on any development. Now that works out at 12 pounds a video. Actually, that's quite annoying when you see it like that, Nick, because we've taken us shitloads of time to put this stuff together. Oh, and it's how many retakes <laughs> we've done? Yeah. Doing the retakes and issues with internet signal. God, I want to be paid a lot more than that per video, Same. mate. <laughs> 12 pound of video, it's ridiculous, but it's 12 pound of video and get it forever. Um, watch the videos over and over again, and it's a, a resource that you'll keep and keep going back to, and you know that it's there to support you ongoingly. So, absolutely fantastic. Um, right, so that's what it is. Now, this is going to be released 
on the 1st of June, okay? So we're just finalizing it now. It's, um, they're being um, edited, the last, last bits of what we have recorded. Tomorrow is our last day of recording and they'll get edited next week and this gets released on the 1st of June. 600 plus VAT on the 1st of June, okay? What we're gonna do though is, if you guys, if you can go to the next slide, We've got an offer for you guys for being on the webinar tonight and it's only um, for pre-order. So if you pre-order um, tonight, then we are going to give you a bonus because obviously it's not out to the 1st of June. You'll get it as soon as it's out. You'll be the first ones to get hold of it. But what we're gonna do is anyone who buys it tonight, um, it's the 600 plus VAT, but we're gonna offer you a bonus site day with me and Nick, okay? I think, you know, you, you, you've heard that, um, You've heard that you know the experience that Nick's got. Um, you know you've seen White Box and what we do. You've seen all the projects that we're on. Uh, we're going to spend a day. Um, obviously, this this is due to um, it's it's governed by COVID. Um, but what we'll do is we're going to and so it is limited with numbers. But what we're going to do is going to do it. We're hoping that we can do it in July. Um, so if you pre-order it um, tonight, you'll get it on the first of June, and as it's the first one is released and you will get access to me and Nick on this site visit. So what we'll do in the morning, we're going to go to St. James, and we're gonna spend the morning looking around our physical site in St. James. We'll tell you why we use timber frames, exactly the process that we went through. We'll talk you through all those modules throughout the day, and you'll understand at a deeper level why we do what we do and how we do, and you'll go away with that information, obviously, to then use it on your sites. And then in the afternoon, we'll spend the morning at St. At, um, at, MK, Simpson MK, and in the afternoon, we'll go back to, you know, hopefully we can go to our offices, we've got a big um, room, we can social distance our, to our heart's content and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we'll spend the afternoon then talking about all of the, the, the product and how you can get the most out of it and project management, you'll go away with a much deeper understanding of how you can make the most out of the tool. So I don't think we can say fair on that. That's only accessible for people who pre-order um, before we release, so uh, i.e. tonight. So if you guys do that, um, there is a link to do that, I believe. Nick? Yep, yeah, so here we go. So if you guys want to do that, clever technology and all that, that's what we do at White Box. It's the White Box way. So if you get your um, camera phone out and you put the picture on and you scan, uh, take a picture in effect of that scan me, then it will take you through to the website and you'll be able to do that pre-order to make sure that you're on that bonus um, site visit day. Um, I think you know you can see from the um, the comments that you know that how comprehensive it is and the people who who know about developing on sites um, what a resource that's going to be. Um, so yeah, it takes through to there. Or you, if you haven't got a uh, camera phone, um, you should get one because they're really good. Um, but you can go onto whitebox dot dot com slash pmm and that will take you through to the site as well. So you can um, put that into your browser. And that will take you through and you'll be able to get to um, to have a look around on that as well there. So um, I think that, you know, I, we haven't had a chance to look for all the questions. We'll go through some questions now, but I think you'll agree um, that, well, I hope you'll agree because we've spent a lot of time on this. Um, and, you know, Nev's put their nice work. Um, Andy, um, good job. There's a few people coming in there. Look, you know, we've put this out there to help support people, you know, as you, as you can see, 600 you know, 600 quid, if we want you guys to be able to take this and smash your developments, um, keep them on time, keep them on budget. If you've got, if you're a developer, don't forget, you know, for 600 quid in a development of like with the example we use, it could be half a million, it could be a million, 600 quid. I think, you know, using these kind of resources, even if you've got your own project manager, um, you can use these resources to make sure that they don't cost you an extra, extra 600 quid. And you've got that for every development you ever go through. You can upskill yourself to be the project manager next time if you want. It might not interest you and you can keep doing that that way. If um, we said earlier there was a question about who do you get to be a project manager and people, um, we talked about you could have a QS, you could have a, an architect. They're going to be quite expensive. You know, they're quite expensive ways of doing it. They'll, they'll do the job but they're obviously an architect, they're gonna be doing architectural work, then you're gonna pay for that privilege. So, you know, for 600 quid, you can um, upskill someone in your team maybe to do it, and they can have the resources to go through. You can obviously, like I say, keep your eye on it and do it yourself. So this is a resource which is gonna be able to um, help any level of developer make sure that they keep 
their developments on time and on budget, which are those key important factors that we're all looking for. Okay, so um, we'll go through some questions. Um, I don't know whether you've been looking at some of those questions, Nick, while I was talking there. I, I liked uh, the question that's coming from A by A Bay again. Just wondering what motivates you to want to teach so many people. Well, do you know what? <laughs> we see so many people come through projects, so come through and must make mistakes. We're trying to help those people not make those mistakes and try to to give them a tool, to give them a toolbox. Let's, let's look at it like this. This is a big red snap-on toolbox that's got all the different spanners and all the different hammers and stuff in it that you can then use to make something work, to fix a job, to solve a problem, and hopefully do that. Now, we can't go out and do that. There is, there's so much more, comp competition isn't really a word, is there? It's, there is, is there competition out there? There's plenty of work for everyone. And to actually help people is a much better thing to give back to the community and the, the, the sort of the, 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 the wider reaching um, sort of element than anything else. Um, does that make a bit of sense or does that <laughs> seem a bit... Yeah, I'll answer that as well because, you know, I've been training, you know, you do train on our course as well. But obviously me and Lloyd have been training for a bit longer. Um, there's, some, there's some real love out there for this, Nick. You've been mm. looking through these. Quite, I've just been looking through them while, um, whilst you were talking then. But yeah, look, you know, there's a lot of people saying thank you and uh, what a great resource it is. Um, Neville sent me a private message um, and I just want to read it if you don't mind, Neville, because, you know, not any, the others won't see this in the chat. He's put, um, paid 10,000 to go to uni and did not, um, did not get a site visit or practical help in this area, only theory. Um, good job, I was a chippy first. So, you know, Neville's got some experience. But, you know, this is a way that you guys can fast track that. There's, um, there's, uh, there's others in there. I know Graham's got experience. There's a lot of other people who've got experience. Jim's on sites and people like that. But, you know, this is a tool that all those guys who are already doing it can go and, and, and hone, sharpen their pencils on their skills. And, you know, even Nick, he uses this kind of information. That's why we put it together to make sure he doesn't miss anything. So, you know, this is a great reference for any size of project and any any um anything like but just go back to that question then why do we do what we do um i can speak for me and lloyd because me and lloyd feel exactly the same about it we absolutely love it we are gutted that we can't be out um training um physically at the moment you know face to face um we love doing the developments you've seen what developments we're on it's not like we don't do developments but um you know we absolutely love getting in front of people and helping them through their journey um, we don't do it for free. You know, we've, we've never claimed that we don't charge for our courses. Obviously, it's a business like any other business. Um, but, you know, at that kind of price for what we're putting in there, you, you can see that it's um, we're very respectful what we charge for it. But it has to be a running business of its own. But I can certainly say that we get much more pleasure with the training side of it than, um, than we do even with the development side of it. We do the developments because we do love them. But to see people progress and to see our, the guys who come through the, the white box training um, come up through and do the, you know, the mastermind, if that suits them. Some people come out to um, Bali and Croatia with us. But to see them go out and start doing those developments. Lloyd put a post out earlier um, where he had like little snippets of um, actual developments that people have been through our training. And there was you know, loads of them. And that was just snippets of the, some of the ones that we've got. So to see, you know, like... Uh, people going through and actually um, accessing what we're teaching them is just so you know it's just another level in in you know self satisfaction if you like and you know we really enjoy it so that's why we do it um, we don't really buy into the whole you're creating a load of um, uh, competition because there's so much opportunity in property and not only that there's more opportunity will come out the back of um, this lockdown than probably we've seen for decades so. This is the time for developers to go out and you know make hay while the sun shines, um, but you've got to do it in a considered way. You've got to do it knowing um, knowing that this stuff exists and that somebody's covering it off because so, every development and every project out there, like I said, has got a project manager, whether you're calling them it or not. So you know, for that kind of price, just make sure that your um, your developments are getting the the due care and attention. To make sure that those big mistakes aren't getting made and you're not going off time and off budget like is probably happens with most developments that go on out there okay uh, neville's but only three percent of the land has been developed on so um 
yeah so you know there's 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 lots of opportunity out there let alone um commercial conversions look let's go on that one then so this works obviously for commercial conversions as well um offices you know we've all been locked up for uh, near enough three months now two and a half three months yeah how many people um or how many offices do you think that people have now they've worked out about zoom and all the other facilities and now they've worked out they can work from home there's going to be a whole lot more working from home businesses are changing the way that they work um we had scott marshall on our network last week and he said that you know they're being so much more flexible with their staff and working hours because we've all been forced into working in a different way so that's going to be more office um, conversion spaces coming up. So there's lots and lots of um, opportunity. Okay, so any more questions that you picked out there, Nick? Um, there was one a moment ago. I was just, it just, I was just looking at the latest ones all popping in. Um, is there a white box course training where we'll have direct access to a sort of mentor in the white box team to send a quick WhatsApp or ask a question via a phone call? That, that does come with the mastermind, Kurt, if that's something you're interested in, that level of um, work, that level yeah, of... Um, I, that's not what we've got here, Kurt. But, um, you know, if you send um, myself or, in fact, my email is, yeah, is on my name there. So, yeah, if you send me or Lloyd um, a, um, a, a message or email through on the white box um, contact form, then, you know, we can have a conversation with, with what we offer on that. But I don't want to confuse things by... Um, by going through that on the webinar, if you don't mind, because it's um, it's a bit of a different thing to what the webinar's about. So uh, Martin Wilds piped up with, who's bringing the donuts on the site visit? Looking forward to it. The, the Martin, we are far too healthy and sophisticated uh -huh. to have donuts. It just doesn't happen, mate. mate so if you thought it was a couple of years ago, mate, we'd have been smashing <laughs> the donuts. <laughs> donuts do not make the abs. It's yeah. not, uh, we, we, our bodies are temples, mate. We can't have the donuts. You, you can have the donuts. You can eat them to your heart's content, but you know, we'll buy we'll, we'll mate. Some, mate. But yeah, we're in a transitional <laughs> period at the minute. So <laughs> I'm actually on a fast day today. Yeah. So I've not eaten anything today. So, but all for health. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, look, the, it's going to be, um, it's going to be an awesome day that um, we do do site visits with our masterminders sometimes and they always, always go away. Absolutely loving it. Um, to physically see um, some of these sites and to go through every aspect of it. It's, um, you know, it's quite a rare occasion to be able to go and do that and have such sort of, you know, if you think that we've, you know, the, 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 the masterclass is giving you a lot of detail, we hold nothing back when you're on site. We'll tell you exactly how we purchased the sites, how it went through. You know, that's part of the project management all the way through. We'll, we'll teach you everything. As I said earlier, none of these projects, not one project will ever go exactly how you want it. It will never go perfectly. There will be different ebbs and weaves. There's different things that will happen and how you deal with them at different stages and what, see, what makes you and what gets you through and makes the project successful. And as Andy said, if we do a site visit, we'll tell you exactly how that happened and how that got to that stage and how we got around that problem to get to the next stage. And that's the nature of these these scenarios we are real people doing real things out there in the real world you can come and see a site you can come and see the dust on the uh, on the ground and everything like that it's not superficial it's not all flannel it's real life um derek said he's trying to sign up but he's getting an error so i'm not quite sure why that is um i think lloyd's listening to this i don't know whether um you can um help out there lloyd but um but yeah i hope that there's not an error with the link but um, yeah, if you've tried on the scan, maybe try on the um, going on the whitebox.mikeajabi.com. Oh, he's booking from Ireland, to be fair. So there may be some sort of reason behind that. I don't know. Okay. Um, well, look, uh, if there is an issue with the fact that you're in Ireland, um, then, you know, we can process the payment, obviously, physically tomorrow. It's a bit late to do it now. Um, obviously, the girls aren't working. Um, but... Um, but yeah, so we'll do that. So uh, there's a, okay, so there's an error on a few people's, so. That's a, that's a, that's a management issue we need to solve straight away. <laughs> yeah, so if you can, um, yeah, so I'll get, Lloyd will be listening to this, I think he'll be trying to solve that. Um, well, Lloyd's I'll... just put a link up again, um, trying to try the link, um, rather than perhaps if you're trying to do it through the QR code and there might be an issue that way, try typing in that link uh, into your, uh, into your uh, Safari or whatever you're using. 
Perhaps it's because there's that many people. You can answer a couple of questions there, Nick. I'll just um, see what I'm sorting out. Yeah, that's it. So many people want to get on it. It's crashed it. Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> that's never a bad thing, is it? See you smiling there, Richard. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, good. So, um, yeah, so let's have a look. Is, is there anyone got any direct questions now? I'll keep scanning back and I'll miss questions. So if you've got any specific questions, pop in the box now and we'll we'll go through there was a couple of questions i remember from earlier there was a lady called stacy on i don't know if she's still about on the query reference grade two i've done a number of grade twos now and they're very rewarding you can pick them up sometimes very cheaply because of the grade two stigma if you know what you're doing and you develop a good enough relationship with certain people you can actually end up doing very well out of it there are certain um uh permitted development rights on grade two listed properties. So for example, uh, there's, if you have a house that's grade two listed and you want to convert it into a HMO, you have an automatic um, development right to do that up to a six bed, which um, if you research that a bit more, I'm not a planning expert, but I've used it, I've done it. I got advised that to do that um, from John McDermott. Um, and then I actually managed to get it scaled up to be in a seven bed actually, to be fair. Grade two listed, my key, key bit of advice with grade two listed, the first thing you do before you put an offer in, before anything, so Stacey, I see you're still here, good, so you're, you're hearing this, go and understand who is your conservation officer for your local council, for your local property, so let's say it's in the next town, go and find out who the conservation officer is, they're usually pretty amicable people that will speak time, with it. they want to preserve those buildings, they want to see those buildings getting used, they want to uh, work on it with you, but they will want you to do it in the right manner. And sometimes that can be quite expensive and you have to allow some uh, extra, um, extra sort of uh, um, leniency in your budget for that. And have I always been perfect with that? No, I haven't, I haven't, because grade two listed aren't my original cup of tea, if you like. I was always new build and, and crashing out the running down a site, a flat site with all the houses going crazy. But grade two listed a very different kettle of fish and you have to do things like um, lime render on a uh, lime plaster, sorry, on the walls. You have to preserve certain internal things. You can look at um, listed building registers to understand what the factors are that you need to um, save on that house, on that property. But yeah, so grade two listed definitely can be a, a good little earner. I've personally done and I've, well, I've retained, I've got two grade two listed houses. I've got a grade two listed seven bed HMO. I've got a block of 10 flats, which eight of them we've got um, full leasehold and freehold and two are leased to other people. And they're all grade two. They're all good. That, um, that uh, bank I showed earlier is a grade two listed bank as well. So I did a uh, full foul of planning on that one. I tried to put a HMO in there and the locals were kicking off. They did not want that. So um, I've had to go down that office, uh, office and apartment scenario, but it's, it still works. It's, it was still nice, but wasn't my first preference. Um, Andre said, which listed building can't be converted? Well, that does intend to depend entirely on um, the building itself, what, what scenario is on the high street, things like that. It, it, there's a lot of things can't be converted, but the one that I was saying could be converted is a house to HMO under permitted developments but you can um, get grade ones is the one you're, you're talking about there, yeah. So a grade two listed building can be converted, but a grade one and one star are the ones you, you really don't want to go near. They are the expensive ones. They're the very, very old, very, very restricted buildings, whereas grade two are a halfway house. Um, yeah. There's um, Just to confirm, uh, um, Derek's got his, um, his order through now, so I think that blockage, I think it was just a bit of... Um, a one hit demand and it crashed it a little bit so um if you couldn't get through before you'll be able to get that on now um then i think jim let me just put there jim's put that over 50 webinars since the beginning of march and this is straight into the top five well done jim thank you very much so um yeah so look jim's on a lot of webinars we knew that anyway but yeah he's, he's clarified it with his 50 there and you know this is um straight in there so it's a big important topic um, hopefully that you know you see that as a a, a massive offer um, with the project management masterclass and especially with the bonus day as well um, as you can see there we'll, we'll tell you everything that we know on the day 
So, and that can be, you know, that can be all your list of building stuff, Andre or anything. So we'll, we'll just go through everything. So yeah. um, what else is coming in? So it was just a couple of more comments about grade two, uh, converted by P. St. Albans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it sort of backs up what I was saying about how you can do these things. Uh, bringing white box to Ireland. I actually spent my summer holiday in Ireland last year, Derek. I love Ireland. Um, I went to uh, Connemara and uh, Dublin. So uh, I was over there in summer. Um, but I don't know if we, uh, we can take white box to Ireland as such, but we're definitely doing it digitally. And that's the beauty of uh, these online um, sort of formats. But yeah, a whiskey tour would be good, Lloyd, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, on vote, uh, we could do that. That would be a, not a bad shout. Excellent. So um, there was maybe a few questions earlier on that we, um, we missed. So I'm sure we'll get the chat um, and we'll go back to those. So, um, yeah, I'm sure sorry, so I, I wrote down a couple as well. Ada um, asked about a building earlier. I think it was about Lawson Street and how we mitigated um, purchasing that with regards to planning. And I think I might have done a quick answer, but yes, that building was bought. Um, Andy secured that one from the council and it was bought subject to planning. And that was a, uh, a nice scenario, wasn't it, Andy? Um, yeah. And um, then uh, the planning did take about four to five, six months to go through by the time we had all the original consultations and things like that. But there wasn't, I don't think there was even one complaint against that one, was it? That was, uh, no, no, clean, it wasn't, no. such a clean um, scenario. So there was that. Um, those are, I'd, I'd written that one down and a couple about the grade two listing. Um, okay, well, Paula, is, uh, Paula Bailey has said, um, good value resource. Great stuff, chaps. Thank you. So, thank you. I'm, I'm hope it um, met your expectation, Paula. You said you were coming on tonight, so good to see you. Yep. Hello, Paula. <laughs> uh, what's your average build cost per square foot? Is not uh, an easy to answer question. There's a lot of um, details that go into that. Um, how would you come up with a, a square foot um, as a project manager, Nick? And, you know, again, it's not an easy question to answer. This, this is a question you get asked by everyone and anyone at any point in time and I say the same thing to everyone I will give you an idea uh, based on my knowledge but as a caveat if you imagine you can build two houses on the same street and one's at one standard and finish and one's at a completely different one I don't know what you're thinking I don't know what you're intending to build so it's a very difficult thing to say in one area you could build for 120 pounds per square foot for the core build price. But once you are now, all the other elements of the site, the landscaping, the drainage and everything like that is, is up to 130, 135, for example. And that is the key thing as well. A builder will say, oh, I can build that for 80 pound a square foot. Well, he might be talking about the core of the build. He might not be talking about the services, the warranties, the building control, all the other stuff around it. So it's a very, very open question that, and it's a very tricky one to give you an estimate. Um, but on the flip side, Ta uh, Talia, if you give me a average build cost, so give me an area and what you're constructing and I can give you a rough idea, but please, please take it with a pinch of salt because I do not know what you're actually building. So if you just want to comment in there a second, there are so many variables, not one site is the same. But, um, I but you know, what we would do is, um, you know, we would have a, you know, if we're looking at offering, we would use our experience on, on you know, getting the initial cost appraisal appraisals together to, to see what we could offer on it um, but you know as it goes progresses along we would use our QS's we would use you know the tenders we would go out to builders once we'd secured a site at a level we would then nail that right down by using all the resources around us and it's the project manager who would tie all those resources together to get that official um, pound per square foot at that point so you know that's there's different levels of even how you get to that so um, yeah, it's a, a difficult one for a, a one question answer, but. So we've got an Essex, three floors, 12 apartments, new build. Okay, well, just uh, near, near, just north of Essex in Cambridge, I had a QS price me up for some apartment building. It came in at all encompassing 160 a square foot. That is new build. That was reasonable average spec for sale. That was concrete floors. That was block paved parking areas at the front. That include all the services, about 160 a square foot. That was from my QS report. That wasn't me just plucking a figure out of the sky. So without any more, 
I'd stick 10% or so on that. So I'd say 170 a square foot, just to give you an absolute benchmark, but please, please do not take that as your offer price. Because That's, um, yeah, that, that again is your, um, you know, you just correctly said that could be split between you could get a builder say build that for 120, but he's not, um, he's not um, <laughs> talking about all the external works and maybe the services and warranties and all the bits that go around it, isn't he? You know? Very good, Jim. Very good. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's specifics and it finishes. And for the record, when I do price stuff and I do a square foot price, carpets are not included. Carpets are not a build cost, right? Just to get that clarity out there, carpets are a vat. When you look at um, a build cost, Carpets are not seen as a fixtures and fitting. They're seen as a separate thing. They are vatted, new build is vatted, uh, vatted at zero rated. It has VAT, but it's zero rated. But when you fit carpets in there, you have to charge the client a 20% because it's not a part of the structure of that building. So it's a separate item as with fitted wardrobes and things like that. So just to, uh, just to chuck that out there, carpets are not part of a build. Although you do put them in builds. Um, I've just seen a okay. comment. Uh, yeah, it's just people, you know, there's a few people are starting to drop off now. I think that let's call it a day on this. Um, you know, you can see now project management is a, a, a massive subject. It's a massive role, um, but there are ways you can do it yourselves. Um, obviously, we've put this together to aid you and to prompt you to make sure you don't miss anything and to, to like I say, keep your build on time and within budget. Um, so look, go out and, um, and you know, hopefully you, many of you guys, uh, I haven't seen you know, who's ordered it yet, I'll see that after, but hopefully you're coming along and you know, we'll, we'll do as many of those days. If there's too many to fit on that day, we'll, we'll perhaps have to look at putting another one because uh, obviously it crashed, so I'm guessing there's quite a lot of people who have, um, have, have wanted it. Uh, Richard Lloyd's just put thank you. I know you wanted to see what, um, what it involved, so hopefully um, that's uh, answered all your questions. John Haywood, uh, again, a friend of White Box. Um, I'm sure that we'll see you down there. So Graham again. So yeah. So thank you very much for your time being with us this evening. And um, you know, go to uh, whitebox.mikeajawi.com/pmm, and there's a whole website which will give you all of the subheadings if you need to have more detail. Um, if you do uh, order that, pre-order it, then you know you'll get access to that day with me and Nick. We'd love to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. See you later.